Fantastic. Uh, welcome to the Live Christian Lee podcast. Um, this is somewhat of a continuation of uh, the previous episode, episode two. This is now episode three. Um, last episode we had Jacob, uh, my brother and uh, gamer and video game extraordinaire, um, with us Get as all French there extraordinaire. It just <laughs> sounded right. <laughs> Um, and this is the continuation of that uh, discussion, but this time we're going to be talking almost exclusively about video games and game culture and how it interacts with Christianity and things like that. So, um, hi Jacob, how you doing? We hey. love you. Hey, thanks. Love you guys too. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing good. I All didn't right. say I love you. I mean, well, uh, well. I love you too. Okay. Yeah. No, I okay. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jacob, um, uh, jumping into video games, uh, what's uh, so great about video games? Well, uh, they're, uh, I don't know, they're, they're, they're really great. Um, I hmm. wasn't, we, wasn't quite ready for that question. Do you want to take, you want to take it slower? Yeah. yeah I'll tell you what, slower. Okay, why I'm don't not. you, why don't you tell us what you're currently playing? Because okay, I yeah, find, okay. like, a lot of video gamers that I know have, like, a game that they're, like, really focused on at a time. Like, something yeah, that they're all about. I don't have one right mm-hmm. now. Uh, what I have, like I have, like I, I separated them kind of into two lists. Like I have my my triple A's that I'm currently playing, which are the the, the big multi million dollar releases that get midnight releases at like, game stores and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And then I have my indies that are not released on a hard copy at all. Uh, you get them for, like digital downloads from Steam, and that's about mm-hmm. it. So my triple A's I'm playing right now are uh, some are kind of new, like on the newer et side, like uh, Shadow of Mordor. Which is a Lord of the Rings Middle Earth game, uh, Destiny, which uh, is newish. Podcast listeners, if you listen to the one of our recent episodes, I told you how Lord of the Rings is one of the things that that has my heart, it's it stolen does. my heart as a yeah. movie series. So I, if you're I love if that. you're if you're a hardcore uh, Lord of the Rings fan, uh, Shadow of Mordor will disappoint you a little bit because they they stray a little bit from Tolkien's uh, Tolkien's base. Um, yeah, but I mean, I was at your house the other night, and it was so cool. Yeah, you chop off a lot of heads in that game. So <laughs> many heads. It was so good. And then yeah. you, like, jumped from a tower onto this, like, wild beast. Yeah. And we're riding this thing around. Yeah, and that's great. what doesn't make sense, is that some Lord of the Rings fan will, will uh, fans will, uh, won't will like how you can turn into a wraith, because wraiths are supposed to be humans, and somehow this mm. human is, is uh, uh, possessed by a... Elf Wraith, which uh-huh. doesn't make sense in the Lord of the Rings world, but it makes sense in the game. Um, That's good. But, yeah. But anyway, the other games that I'm playing are Destiny, which is kind of new. It's been out for, I don't know, what, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, um, six months or so. Five months. Um, and then I'm also playing some of the older ones, Titanfall, I can't get myself away from, and Forza 5, uh, which is just a racing sim. And then... Um, Indie games. These are all. These are all pretty new. Uh, most of the games them that I've never the, heard of, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, which is th- funny because those games were also ones that I've never heard of. See, I've uh, heard of all those, you... but only because of Jacob. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I played the, the Forza game, and that I, I drive a stick shift, and you had to set this up as stick shift in the game. Is it automatically stick shift? It's automatically automatic. Automatic. I switched automatic. it to, to stick shift because it's more sim like. Yeah, it was. It was so mm-hmm. much fun. I. It had this cool thing, I crash into a wall, and then it's like, shoot, rewind, and then you just rewind until the point where you realize, I screwed up, and then you just go right before that and don't screw up. And I wish you, yeah. all video games were like that. I wish real life was like that. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Just rewind, it'd be like that movie Click with Adam Sandler. 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 Is that him? Yeah. That was yeah. Him. Anyway, yeah. Jacob. So just you. to give perspective, <laughs> if, given that we're talking to Jacob today about video games, friends of the podcast, I am... Not very good at video games. I just I don't know how to say that any plainer. 
I am the last time I was good at a game was Super Mario World. Yes. That was a long time ago. That was on a Super Nintendo. Yes. Yeah. Quite a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't call myself necessarily awesome at it, but uh, I at them. I just I, I but I really appreciate them as a as an art form, as a medium for entertainment. There, this is my question. I was going to say, this yeah. is the answer to my yeah. original question that I don't know, stumbled yeah, you. Yeah, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so... Um, you started yeah, by slow work there. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I respect them, and I respect them as how they can be a, a hobby. And, uh, and I'm, I get frustrated as a, as a gamer that, they, that they, people don't understand how it can be a hobby, and instead they attach it to uh, addiction level, like mm-hmm. video games equal heroin. Um, where video games can equal fantasy football. People can get obsessed with it, but also people can have a healthy obsession with it where they enjoy it with their friends. It can be on the same level as uh, music. You go and find new music or, or, or reading, and you, you have your each pe- person has their argument of whether it's healthy or not or whatever, but I think all... All hobbies can turn one way or the other, and mm-hmm. so do you think gaming is becoming more socially acceptable now? Uh, to a degree, but also like we're talking, you know, about being Christianly here, and uh, it's it's. I find that the Christian culture in general is is a little more uh, bullheaded about accepting it as a as a as something that makes sense, like they still see I, it as I'm a just time wasting addiction. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to stick with like the. Um, the fantasy football thing, because that's pretty pervasive. I, I don't do yeah. it. Do either you do it? I I just did it for the first time this past year uh, because there were some people at work that were doing it. Mm-hmm. I never, um, I don't really have a lot of time, and it always seemed like something that those friends that I had who played it spent a lot of time, like invested in researching different players and following really closely and I didn't yeah. have that so I did it casually as part of work yeah this year. and you see that and then like there's people who play video games casually and then there's people who are who are like into me. it and know yeah and then they then there's people who know exactly you know they know all about it and then there's people uh, with fantasy football who know way too much about it and that's exactly just how video games can be I I, I try to stay away from uh, you know the, there there is addictive habits that can be gained from or formed around video games Mm -hmm. and that is where it becomes unhealthy when you when you obviously like any addiction you know this is we're talking about like that's a whole other podcast to talk about is addiction but uh yeah so and anything can be can be that way but video games i feel like i feel like at a at a meta level with uh humans you know humanity in general it's kind of becoming more more respected of an art form or a, uh, at least an entertainment form, um, but a lot of gamer culture doesn't help perpetuate that. They help perpetuate the the idea that that gamers are just immature um, and don't know how to not be addicted. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, I just want to finish answering your question earlier, whereas what I'm playing because I kind of want to give these guys a a shout out because these are awesome games and they are like as as you kind of mentioned that I'm a novice game developer I am just working my way up through through learning how to uh how how to, how to code and get get an actual working game and like I, I I do it's a working game but it's it's no more than a tech demo of skill and so I I'm I don't have a a a named game that I can that I can say this is what I'm working on but but when you do I'm going to beat it good Good. Like I, need, uh, I need QA testers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to beat that game so good. Yeah, but these guys, I, I look up to these to these indie developers that uh, that have small teams and end up making really amazing games, not by having the most the most amazing uh, graphics and the huge polygon characters. Um, that you know you need a, you need an Xbox One or a PS4 or a PC to play on, but instead they're they're low demand games that are just really fun by mechanics. So the ones that I'm playing right now is number one is Transistor. That's the only one that I'm the indie game that I'm playing right now that's not in early access. So it's a it's a it's a game about a mute opera singer. That yeah <laughs> she was. 
The story is, is still... I'm still working my way through it. So the, the story is a little confusing as to how she became mute, but she's an opera singer. So um, her companion is a giant sword called a transistor who talks to her. So most of the game's um, vocals, you know, um, voice acting is done through this through this sword, the transistor that guides you through the game. So it's really interesting, very deep gameplay. Um, but the story is, is kind of ambiguous at this point. I can't quite figure it out. The other games that I'm playing... Well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just one. Is that... That sounds like something that I've heard from indie games or maybe games in general about the reason that people like them is that like you have to discover the story as you go along. Mm-hmm. Is that is that something that you kind of find to be... Like, I don't know what your relationship... Or like, how you feel about movies versus video games, but a movie is like a pre-written thing that just guides you from beginning to end of a story whereas a game you're you're involved in that is that like one of the things that you find to be particularly i find when games allow you to discover the story for yourself it's a much more satisfying experience there there are games that are written with a with a beginning middle and end of a story games that are very narrative driven like uh like the last of us which is a survival horror post-apocalyptic game and uh, telltale games that are just story focused. They have no action or anything. They just have like basic movements that you can do. And those are kind of ones that, that the story is presented to you in a very obvious way. Where other games where you can kind of make your own story and the it's, it's presented in an ambiguous way that you can make yeah make it for yourself and uh, kind of make up your own story about about what is in the world. So Transistor doesn't quite work that way. It does It does have a story, it's just a little confusing as to how it's presented. But the, the, more, the more time you spend in the world, the more, um, the more, the more it's fleshed out. But, but these other games that I'm playing have absolutely no story at all, but they're some of the most fun games we've ever played. Um, they're all in early access, um, and which you can like get, to, get them on Steam for, for cheap while they're still in development. And uh, what I mean, they're like beta testing, and they're or yeah. is it okay? Yeah, they're so that's it, it's how it's how developers uh, help get funded for their for their projects is that they they release something that is not quite totally finished, um, but it, it's released out there for people to for people to test out and see, and then they get money. You know, they they don't charge people the full price of the game. They get money um, for for buying this this uh, unfinished copy with the promise of um, finishing it, and then you get to keep it for that cheap price. Mm. So um, one of the big games I'm playing right now is Besiege, which is a... It, it has no story at all, except for you are this... I don't know, maybe this... You're this bodiless god figure, and you create siege machines and besiege the town. you were showing me. I was showing you. Okay. And it's all physics-based, and it is hilarious. Just... I love physics in games, and mm-hmm. so yeah. Just to, and I, I do want to mention uh, that is by Spiderling Games. They're yeah. I, I haven't heard of anything else that they've made, but they're they're great. And also, other two other that I'm playing also in early access are Darkest Dungeon, which is a um, a game in a subgenre called a roguelike uh, that is is interesting because characters don't only don't only have health, but they have stress level. So like the more stressed out you get, your your characters can abandon you and like run out. So the point is is that you're it, it's called Darkest Dungeon, so you're raiding dungeons. And like if you run into an extra scary monster, your your character can get a stress damage. Mm-hmm. And he'll be like he'll want to run away. The game and if, sounds and if he gets, very much like real life. Yeah. <laughs> And, and if he gets, when I run into like some random person's house, <laughs> stress level goes really high. <laughs> yes, you so done that. that. <laughs> Let's just run into this guy's house, you know. Um, so yeah, if they get too stressed out, then they'll just abandon you, and then you'll be only left with with half your party left. Uh, so so that's an interesting one, and and it has some pretty deeper deeper uh, kind of thoughts behind it than than most games do, as far as like living. Mm-hmm. Christian Lee goes um, confronting confronting fears and, and how you face them uh, but anyway the last one that I'm playing and then I'm done with this list is uh, The Long Dark which is a also basically storyless game at this point because it's early access it has no story mode it just has a sandbox mode 
It's just sandbox. Uh, sand- oh, sandbox. Play around. Yeah, sandbox okay. meaning it's endless. Uh, yeah, so it's a survival, not horror, just survival game where you're given this very loose story of you crashed in the uh, in a plane in the. Uh, Did I see a trailer Alaskan for this? Wilderness. Did we have a conversation about this? I don't know. It's very utopian, like. Maybe not. No, no, it's all uh, it's all it, c- nope. uh, Canadian wilderness, not Wrong. Alaskan wilderness. I meant to say, sorry. Canadian wilderness, and everything is like log cabins and everything that you run into, and uh, it's 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 very fun, but also obviously very early access. And I look up to all these games for being um, inspirations. They they use the same engine that I'm that I'm learning on, that I'm making my first game on, and they they just they are great there. They're, they're simple. They're low demand on systems, so you don't need to have a huge, uh, a huge awesome computer to run them. And they're simple graphics, and they're just but they're beautiful. And uh, yeah, this one's all about just surviving and uh, you know crafting crafting items for you to survive and, and finding food and uh, surviving wolf attacks because there's apparently lots of wolves in the Canadian wilderness. Well, log cabins and wolves. I mean, that's pretty much all Canada is, right? Yeah. Well, and you got some some moose, eh? And, some, uh, yeah. And some play a little bit of hockey, huh? Yeah. How about well, that? And Tim Hortons. Some... <laughs> is this like Western Canada by Alaska? The, this is whatever. This is all of Canada. It sounds exactly the same no matter where you go. Does it? Eh? It does. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, side note. it's funny though. I, I I feel like I need to say this. Did you know that Ontario is the only province really that speaks like that? No. You know I why? Because the rest of it they speak French natively. Yeah. Yeah. So that that that's in Ontario, and then most of the rest of Canada, speaks you French. won't you won't have. But when you talk about Canadians, it's that's so what they sound it's like so, when they come here. And right. It's so prevalent. Buy our People food. just. Eh? <laughs> yeah. I well, I did work at a Tim Hortons for a little while, and they would come by, and someone actually asked me if they could get a Canadian discount. It's like, oh, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a hug. I, it's no Canadian discount. Were they wearing a toque? Uh, yeah, probably. What's a toque? It's a hat. Oh. It's yeah. A hat. With a little, the flaps. You know, I didn't know what a toque was yeah. until I played The Long Dark. Oh. And then I picked it up, and I said, I said what the heck is a toque? Friends of the and podcast. Then, and then I... Video games teach you things. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put it on, and it said, hat, Canadian style. <laughs> and I knew what a toque was after that. See? See? Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> so I, I've noticed, as far as um, gaming goes, it's becoming a lot more artistic and a lot more, like, there seems to be a lot higher production value and stuff. Like, as movies start to get kind of... You know, up in the millions and... Has there been a billion-dollar movie? Probably. Like, h- hundreds of millions of dollars in production value. Is that the same kind of trend you notice in gaming, too? Or is it... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the AAA, the AAA games that I was talking about, like Destiny, that is a game that Activision, the producer... I mean, yeah. The, sorry, the publisher, uh, had a contract with Bungie, the developer, for $500 million Whoa. to develop Destiny. So uh, you could the, their their contract for that game is is public, so you could see exactly what the five hundred million dollars went to. The idea is that they didn't use five hundred million dollars to uh, develop one game, but they they're using that five hundred million dollars to develop the game for a ten year lifespan. So oh. that is a I don't know I'm I'm not in the film industry, so I don't know how much you know movies take, but right probably uh, I, I, five hundred million is a lot of money. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're they're getting they're getting huge, but it also feels like uh, games are getting more, or developers in general are becoming more comfortable with what they're releasing. Because if you pay any attention to the game industry over the last this last year, twenty fourteen was kind of a mess as far as the game industry is concerned. Because there's multiple games that's been released with game breaking problems that people don't even want to play the games because. Um, because they're so broken. So I, you, Eliza, you play Nintendo, yeah. which is a revered developer, except for some weird things that they do on, in their, in their, with their PR. But uh, <laughs> Microsoft and Sony and the, and, and the, the major developers like Ubisoft and uh, 343 Industries, they release games. Ubisoft had a huge debacle with Assassin's Creed Unity that their game was 
pretty much unplayable when it came out. So that was another. I don't know what what exactly the the, the budget was on it, but there were so many bugs, so many glitches in the game that it was almost totally unplayable. As an apology, they end up giving free DLC. Yeah, I was going to ask, is that why? Like, is it because people are so reliant on the downloadable content that yeah, that's, it's almost that's like a, they don't feel like they have to make everything perfect before they release it? Unlike, you know, back in the back in the day with, like, N64 and even GameCube, and I notice I'm just saying Nintendo systems. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I think. Yeah. Back in the a, day. We but, haven't forgot about you, Sega Dreamcast. No, we haven't. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a big thing that, that that I feel like they're relying on, and that's part of the criticism of the of the um, the the industry, is that they they rely so much on DLC they can't, or the they're pushed out the the development is pushed out the door by the publisher because they want money, right. and mm-hmm. uh, that doesn't mean to say that the publishers are always the evil ones, but the pu- the publishers set the set the release dates. And the developers can't always make them, so they say, "Okay, we'll release it and then create a patch." Right. So that's what the problem was with uh, Microsoft publishing 343 Industries games, Halo: The Master Chief Collection, which is one of my all-time favorite games. I don't even know if I mentioned playing it that I was currently playing it, which I am. Um, is that like one of those ones that you just are always playing? I, I'm always playing it. Yeah, <laughs> I've I've been trying to beat Halo 2 solo on Legendary ever since I got that game, and it's stinking hard. Um, anyway, I beat so, legendary with a handgun. NBD. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'd be also be Tetris. <laughs> I bet you also be Goldeneye on slappers only. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I'll just slap at the Russians. Yeah. Well, I, I mean that's what I did when sniping people. You just throw your slapper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your hand just comes. Is that what that? <laughs> yeah. Rings yeah. Back. That's incredible. Take your arm off. I, I wasn't aware. See, this is how little I knew about video games. <laughs> So anyway, he when they like when a they uh, yeah. when they released that game, like the single player stuff works fine, but any matchmaking would take literally hours to find a match. Where if you know anything about Halo, mu- uh, multiplayer is a huge part of it. I yeah. like single player. I like killing aliens. I'm not a huge competitive player, so I, it didn't really bother me. But you take up to three hours, five hours to find a game, and that still isn't fixed. This is it was released in November. It is four months, sorry, three months later, and it's still not fixed. And so they they're giving away free DLC too, and uh, like free free maps and and an entire free remastered game, Halo Three ODST. They're going to remaster it for the Master Chief Collection and give it to the people who who have suffered, quote unquote, suffered through this. Well, and I and I agree with that, quote unquote, by the way, because if you spend sixty bucks on the game, on the thing, yeah. you you you're expecting to play it, so. Right. You're talking about suffered in the. the I know you did the quote unquote the because, like, in the grand scheme of things, kind of yeah, thing, right, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so you expect to be able to play these games like Assassin's Creed Unity, which is broken, Master, uh, Master Chief Collection, which is broken, uh, other other games that, that that are just that are just broken out the door. And uh, so uh, yeah, I feel like a problem in the industry right now is it, developers uh, relying on DLC to fix their to fix their games, publishers pushing them out the door too fast, and. Uh, it's it's really making pushing gamers to to have like you know there's there's forums all over the place that say don't uh, don't pre-order any more games and now we're we're super questionable about uh, or super suspicious about any game that's coming out in the future like some games I'm really excited about are uh, the, the Division by Tom Clancy it's going to be released by Ubisoft which had to hu- shot themselves huge in the foot with Assassin's Creed so it's the same developer. And I don't know if I want to trust it. I'm super excited about it, but do I want to pre-order it? Because maybe it'll be crap. Because uh, they right. did they they screwed up Assassin's Creed. Same thing with Halo Five. I love it, but they screwed up the Master Chief Collection so much. Do I want to pre-order it? I did because I love Halo. But <laughs> this, friends, is how the free market works. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna say that. Hashtag libertarian. <laughs> yep. All right. I, well, one, one of these days we're going to have an episode mm, like that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, sir. <laughs> It'll be just me by myself late at night talking into my the microphone. Yeah. Anyway, um, so <laughs> the uh, I, in addition to the, the higher production value and stuff, I've noticed, too, like that there's a lot more arts and stuff going into it. Um, I know it's always, I mean, since I pretty much started playing games, there's always just been a, a decent level of art to it. But now with the new graphics and stuff like that, it's kind of upped the level of it, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot more games being released that uh, that, that take a, a lot more artistic approach. Like yeah. it's not just it's not just going for the for the gritty realism of Call of Duty games, which have their level of art definitely because oh, sure. they have to each each person and gun and 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 building has to be modeled. But uh, but there's a much more artistic approach to games like uh, like the one I mentioned earlier, the Long Dark. It's it doesn't take a take a photo excuse me photorealistic approach. Instead, it takes a an artistic approach. It looks like an, it looks like you're walking through an oil painting, uh, and it's beautiful. Oh, but there, was, it's there was a game not realistic. a little while like a few years ago, uh, a wolf. Right, there was a wolf. And oh, was, Wolf was, Among Us. No, no, no that's not. Was like Otaku or something? Otaku. Oh, um, Okami. Okami. Yeah, that was really cool. It's like, like you're, that's what like you're walking through an, a literal oil painting. Yeah, because like you, I really you, enjoyed your, that. Your wolf's the, tail is a paintbrush. An hour that I played it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I really, I really appreciate that. How how people can see like pictures of games and they think it's art and they're like, I can, I can be in that world, I can live in that painting. That's amazing. Yeah, that's super cool. Mm. It's almost like mm. Super Mario. You know, Mario 64 jumping in all these paintings. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then there's games that, that, that do try to take the photorealistic approach, except they they have they have things that don't exist in this world. Like I mentioned, you know, Destiny. Destiny, Titanfall, Halo. They all have... I love sci-fi. And so they, they take a more of a photorealistic approach, uh, but they, they do it with things that don't exist in this world. They invent, they invent aliens. They invent giant robots that don't exist. And th- all of that requires a huge amount of imagination and a huge amount of artistic talent. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. So, um, one of the things that I that we were wanting to ask you about was some of the things that are have more like a biblical theme. Um, I know that there have been uh, games that have been specifically marketed to Christians, like Dan. What was that game that you mentioned? The Bible Man. Bi- was that what it was? I don't know. Was it no, there was a no like guitar hero for Christians or something like oh, that? Oh there was, yeah, there was like a rock band when rock band was really huge a couple yeah. of years ago. There was a, a like a rock band Christian edition. It wasn't like the real actual game, but it was like That's what inspired you. It was in like Christian leader, publishers. Right? That's exactly what inspired me. <laughs> That's actually how I learned to play guitar. <laughs> which <laughs> makes it really awkward now because I only know how to hit like barred chords on just five keys. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Which actually <laughs> that's what most of worship music anyway it's five chords five right. chords so. <laughs> <Five quarts. laughs> yeah slip, slipping that in there <laughs> yeah that's fine so as far as like uh, Jacob the, 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 the biblical themes like I've, yeah. I've noticed that in at least in some movies and stuff like with uh, not the most recent Man of Steel but because uh, I haven't seen the most recent one but the um, the one that came out a few years ago yeah. like when he was going out of the spaceship or whatever he was clearly representing Christ on the cross like as he's going, oh, I'm, you know, going out yeah. of the spaceship to go save the Earth. Are there the same types of things in, in games? Yes, absolutely, definitely. Like you, you mentioned, uh, just just to answer your your earlier question, yeah, the like I don't know much about that Guitar Hero game, but like there's there's other games like the Bible Man game, are there, and and other other games that's uh, you controlled uh, Noah trying to get animals into the ark, and uh, uh-huh. j- just these unlicensed Super Nintendo games that were awful. Terrible. Did it, it, it sounds like a variant of like Pikmin or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, get this. Like, you know, your you know how, you know how, <laughs> yeah. You know how in Pikmin you can like k- pick things out of the ground and then yeah. you like carry them around in your hand. Yeah. That's how Noah was carrying cows around. <laughs> so you like we just your, talked about this about earlier tonight. Cows, yeah. We yeah. did. <laughs> so so your your job is to go get a male and female of, of like each of these animals and you pick them up and lift them right over your head. Like it's just ridiculous. He, so he's huge. And it, they're, they're buggy games that don't make any sense. And then there's like this. No, uh, Moses game and, and where like you lead the Egyptians out of the out of the out of e- I mean uh, slaves out of Egypt and they're 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 stupid games they're 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 games that were made specifically to try and cater to Christians but they were poor poorly made they were I, I, this was at the same time you were talking like Super Mario three mm-hmm. was out at the same time that was like a beautiful game that was pushing the limits of the Super Nintendo they released these Christian games that were. They looked awful, they played worse, and they were unlicensed. So they, they came in they came in cartridges that weren't licensed by Nintendo. And other than that Now what would be the reason they would is it because it didn't go through a, a licensing process with Nintendo? I, I would or because Nintendo didn't like fund development of these games or Yeah. I, would I, I know I Nintendo's say, been picky as far as the things that they licensed. Oh Nintendo's right? very picky. But I, I imagine I mean 
they they were one of the only two, uh, like Sega and Nintendo mm-hmm. at the time. So I I don't imagine that they would that they would have let much through, and I don't think they they would have denied them on the basis that uh, that they're a Christian game, but they denied them on quality, mm-hmm. because the quality was so poor. They don't want these games, and being associated their with their system. Name. Yeah, yeah. So 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 they released them unlicensed and. They made it out there only, you know, very few because they didn't have the publishing money for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could make another free market joke here, but I'm like, oh, you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, there. Is, so I don't, I don't really. Other than those, I don't know of any overtly Christian games you're playing with Bible characters, right? But uh, and I think that's good because there is so much symbolism that can be done through mm-hmm. through games and I know I've already mentioned Destiny a few times and if you're a gamer out there and you're you're listening to this I am aware of how many problems Destiny has <laughs> but if you if you if you play Destiny you know that it's one of those games that you keep playing and you don't know why and you can't stop playing it but you hate it and I mean and then I'm in that same exact situation so anyway Destiny as a as a, a short a short story, so uh, we're humanity, right? It's the world. It's the year twenty fifteen, somewhere in the near future. That's true. Um, it is. Wow, is this what Destiny is like? <laughs> you are painting a vivid picture, my friend. <laughs> somewhere in the near future, uh, at, at a time where we can send humanity to Mars, which is conceivable, mm-hmm. like that's what NASA is planning. Um, uh, in in the beginning cutscene, it opens up and there's there's this giant white ball that shows up on on Mars and it turns out to be this thing called the traveler and uh, maybe I'll just explain the, the the quick story of destiny and then explain how it parallels to the Bible so the traveler shows up it ends up accelerating humanity to 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 extremely high heights the uh, it, the beginning cutscene says that life's our lifespan triples and uh, technology rockets hundreds of years into the future. They call it the golden age of humanity. Um, and then this ambiguous character called the darkness shows up, and it's very frustrating because I was expecting more of a story, and then they just say, the darkness. So it, it, it shows up, it fights against the Traveler. Uh, humanity loves the Traveler because the Traveler has elevated them, has elevated humanity. So humanity wants to fight back. We can't. We can't do it. The darkness destroys all of humanity except for except for in one city called the Last City. So all of this is very very vague. Um, and so anyway, then then they're they're fighting back. The, the, the traveler is all but destroyed. In its dying breath, it sends out basically these these ghosts. They're called they're called ghosts. They're like angels. They they go out and they they, they resurrect guardians to fight for you, to fight for him and push back the darkness. So that's the loose story of destiny. So, and I think that parallels so much to the Bible. The arrival of the traveler is like is like creation. Uh, the, the traveler shows up, and now, now in this story, humanity is already created. The, uh, the traveler ushers in the golden age, which is the Garden of Eden. Everybody um, is. Is perfect. Everything is great. Everybody's living living for for a long time. Uh, technology is is wonderful. And this isn't like a, a direct correlation, but I feel like it. I feel like it really applies. So, humanity doesn't fall because of a, because of a a sin, as in like Genesis, but instead they fall because darkness mm-hmm. seeps into the world. Darkness is obviously like it's pretty parallel to sin here. Mm-hmm. Darkness comes into the world and brings all these these. Uh, malevolent aliens with it and these aliens destroy humanity and they call them the darkness so when the traveler falls then it's like a parallelism to the the jesus sacrificing himself he sacrifices himself to save humanity so most of humanity is destroyed except for this last city but where the traveler sacrifices itself and dies it dies over this last city where anybody anybody in the light of the traveler which is in this city they survive and that's like christianity when sin absorbs the world the only people who will be saved from god's wrath are people who under the light are those on, in in the light in the light of god it, that that have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. 
so I I uh, I don't know if I made a if I made quite a clear case for that, but like for, for me that it it, it it seems so it seems so direct. Like we with as humanity identify so much with with sacrifice. Like if if somebody if somebody jumps in front of a jumps in front of a bullet for somebody, that person is deemed a hero. Mm-hmm. If somebody just gets shot, then it's just like oh that was sad. We identify with sacrifice, whether it be Jesus or in video games, this this traveler. It sacrificed itself for us. These ghosts go out into the world, rise up these guardians to fight back the fight back the darkness, and which in this world that we're living in is disciples of Jesus fighting back sin. It's our job mm-hmm. to go out into the world, witness to people, spread the light of God. Mm-hmm. So in Destiny, you're not you're not converting aliens to to, <laughs> to, to, be, to be good people. Oh, so it's not that close. Yeah. To... <laughs> but you're but you're fighting back against the growing yeah. influence of the darkness, as we are fighting back against the growing influence of sin in the world. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there, especially in that game, there there is just so many parallels to 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 much deeper things, like to much deeper um, uh, yeah thoughts. So it's not. It's not like, uh, you know, in Super Mario, you're not just jumping on jumping on bricks and, and eating mushrooms anymore. There is so much deeper, deeper of thoughts. That sounds like that came right out of the '60s. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's. I mean, that that makes a lot of sense because um, even even if they weren't direct uh, parallels, and this kind of speaks to what you were saying before about um, the artistry of you know creating a video game. Um, they're they're beautiful stories, mm-hmm. you know, for uh, people who um, hold sacrifice up as something that's um, extremely noble and you know it's it's worthy of you know pra- the praise of other people. You know, to see somebody who is willing to sacrifice, um, even if they weren't, even if they're not direct, they're they're both beautiful, like depictions, yeah, of of that or examples. You know, and so you can see, um, you can see that and be reminded of that as you you play a video game, even if that's not how the, you know, the artist necessarily intended it. You see the beauty that's present there, that's also present in the um, the story of um, faith yeah. that's in your life too. Yeah, definitely. And um, I feel like not just, not just. That things need to need need to parallel to be to be or parallel the Bible to be related relatable mm-hmm. to our lives. Right. Um, but there's also just games that are that are covering much deeper topics than they ever have before. Again, you're not you're not just jumping on, on bricks anymore. Uh, in Call of Duty, you're not just. I mean, in Call of Duty, you specifically just shoot people, and your hero never shows remorse. So there are games that that. That don't confront those those mm-hmm. those deeper those deeper issues, like Call of Duty, like uh, Battlefield, like um, most 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 games, because uh, it's easier. It's easier to just get into the action, shoot some people, rely on good gameplay, but ignore the ignore the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Then there's other games that make you think about what you're doing. Uh, for example, that Darkest Dungeon I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Now this is a this is like a high fantasy kind of thing where you go in dungeons and you're fighting goblins and and ghouls and 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 uh, skeletons. So it's not. I like it. Yeah, you like it. <laughs> yeah. So it's not necessarily realistic, obviously. But like you go in there and if you if you kill something that was once alive, your character gets a gets a bubble over its head. Maybe it doesn't happen all the time, but it kills like a zombie type thing. And it's like it's your character thinks, "Wow, that was a human." It gets stressed out. It's unable to fight because it's too stressed out. You need to battle through those things. You need to you need to keep your team encouraged with bringing a priest mm-hmm. along, bringing a some type of cleric along to 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 pray for your team and to keep them encouraged. Mm-hmm. So in those in those type of uh, experiences, your 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 religious aspect is so important uh, because your team is dealing with the horrors of what battle can be. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it does the same thing in uh, The Last of Us, which is a, a really popular. It was like a tons of game of year game of the year awards in 2013. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic survival game, um, and 
as we all are familiar, maybe familiar with post-apocalyptic scenes, it always illustrates the fact that, okay, there's, there's the enemy, there's the, the brainless enemies that we have to fight, like zombies, or in this game they're called clickers. Um, and then there's, and then there's the, exactly. And then there's, there's the, one now <laughs> outside the window, listening to our podcast yeah. with the guy from the first episode. <laughs> one of the feeling. And then there's the raiders or like the, the bandits mm-hmm. and you have to kill them because you can't not. And this game confronts very, uh, very bluntly the idea of justified murder versus not like you you are a you're you're a, you're a hardened old man named Joel and you have a you have a, a girl with you that's a that's a young teenager and her name is Ellie every time she she never kills anybody until much later in the game where she gets alone but anyway spoilers she yeah sorry spoiler alert <laughs> um so she uh she questions everything you do the first time you kill somebody she asks why would you do that that was a that was a person that wasn't one of the clickers and you, your character is hardened, but he he confronts that. You see the emotion in his face. Mm-hmm. That 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 narrative that they're walking you through, they make you confront and think about what you did. Like he has to so, justify it to her. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy. It's a video game, so it's easy for you to just say, for not identify with that emotion uh, mm-hmm. of and just say, all right, I killed him. Okay, whatever. Stop talking to me, Ellie. But if you're if you're into this game, if you're following the narrative, that's going to affect you. You're going to say, "Why did I do this? Why, why why did I why did I have to do this?" And and justify with the idea of of what you have to sacrifice to to survive and what you have to do to survive and and, and deeper deeper thoughts like that. Um, and then there's other games like uh, again, it's like high fantasy games like the Diablo series, which is a popular. Um, uh, action RPG that you you play as characters called uh, Nephilim, which is a biblical term. So it's not like when the when the Bible talks about Nephilim, it talks about them being great warriors, and that's all it says. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you never really know what they are. And this this Diablo game kind of brings it to life. So you you, you hear the name Diablo, and you're like, wait, that's not a game that I want to play until you realize that you're fighting against Diablo. You're fighting against... His name His name in the game is uh, Diablo the Prime Evil. And controlling your Nephilim, you fight the other the other demons named Belial, Lord of Lies, Asmodan, Lord of Sin, and Rakanoth, Lord of Despair. So it confronts these ideas of what evil can do to the world. You walk into, you walk into a city, uh, it's called... Uh, the first one you walk, and walk into, it's called Tristram. Later in the game, you see it, and it's and it's and it's destroyed because of because of the evil in it. You walk into other cities, and like, if you don't, if I mean, you can't. It's it's a direct narrative, so you don't have a choice not to kill these demons. But if you don't, you see the effects of it. You mm-hmm. see, and why are you doing that? Well, it's because her name is Lord of Lies, Lord of Sin, and Lord of Despair. Mm-hmm. It's like it it confronts it, this. It's more of an action game. It doesn't confront those ideas directly, mm-hmm. but. I feel like representative of yeah. larger themes than exactly video games are. I believe are a good avenue to to get deeper ideas across. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So uh, I I do have a question about so the with, within the last uh, several months. I think it might have been earlier last year. Um, there was a pretty large thing in um, the media. We're kind of shifting gears here a little bit. Um, they got a lot of attention for the video game world. And I, I feel like the video game world kind of tends to be like its own thing a lot. You don't hear about it in the news very much. Yeah, uh, It kind of has it has its own following. Um, but there was this thing called Gamergate that was, that was pretty big last year. Uh, it seemed really controversial. Um, and I guess I, I know very little about it. Um, but I know that it was a pretty big deal to those who are in the gaming community. And so I was curious if you can summarize like maybe a little bit about what that was and what happened and, and what maybe your take is on some of that. Yeah. I avoided it like the plague. 
And I don't play video games, so I only knew that it existed and didn't yeah. understand most. I just saw it on Twitter, and I'm like, uh, Gamergate had something to do with a girl. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, you. Uh, I I also avoid the, like the plague, except I'm I'm in this industry, and I'm and I'm trying to get more into it. So I I I do know about it, and it was very. There, there are certain things that, that came out of it that are good, certain things that came out of it that are really ridiculous. So basically, the, the point was is that all said and done, like, summarized in one sentence, it was the catalyst, like Gamergate, the hashtag, was a catalyst for an investigation, a deeper investigation into the game industry. And why did that happen? It's because it all started with a reviewer at... Actually, I'm not going to say with a site that he is because I, I'm not positive. A reviewer was thought to have given a favorable coverage to a game because of a personal relationship with one of the developers or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then Kotaku, which is a game journal site, journalism site, they say that didn't happen. And then after that, uh, it, it, at that point, it was a, it was a small issue. It's just like, did you give this game a better rating? Oh no, he didn't. No, he didn't. He just whatever. You're you're misunderstanding. So, uh, the the hashtag Gamergate was created by Adam Baldwin. Where if you're a sci-fi fan, you'll recognize him as Jane from Firefly. I don't know if you know what that is, but anyway, um, I don't. But I know that there will be some person listening to the podcast. One of our podcast listeners <laughs> that will person, know. I'm sure that person is a friend of the podcast. That's right. <laughs> so. <laughs> Friend um, of the show, unnamed podcast listener. <laughs> yeah. After that, G- Gamergate, because of, you know, whatever, all these gate kind of type of scandals, mm-hmm. these yeah. these game journalism publications all attach onto it, and journalism feeds off of negativity. Mm-hmm. Even game journalism, where we, we like to think that game, that game, the game uh, industry or community is a, is a close-knit community, except we'll all give in to that same... Uh, What's the word here? Vitriol? Mm-hmm. If yeah. it's there. Mania. Yeah. And the mania was that uh, this Gamergate was created and people are arguing and now now everybody, everybody started to question, are people getting are people getting uh, better reviews because they're paying for it? A popular YouTuber, um, Total Biscuit. You ever heard of him? Uh, I think so. I don't know anything yeah, about him. Yeah, he's, he's really, you probably just heard the name. Total yeah. Biscuit, the cynical Brit is his name, and the questions were about him, of if, if he was putting out YouTube videos because someone paid him more money. And, uh, this all is this basically a conspiracy theory. Exactly, except, <laughs> except it, a lot of it was, was founded, and like he lost tons of subscribers. I'm not going to get into whether I agree or not, because I really don't care. Like I said, I, I, I avoided like, the plague too, but then like all these gamers are, are, are hash, uh, hashtagging Gamergate because like... Oh well, that means IGN and uh, Polygon and Joystick are all, which are all uh, game journalism sites. They're all probably getting paid too. And like, you know what? I don't care. I have my websites that I trust for for game news, so I'll just keep going to them because, whatever, uh, because they they haven't really be- betrayed my trust at this point. And then um, games start. All these journalism sites start saying they all release this almost the same. Uh, article in like a two or three day span asking what is a gamer and like me as a gamer I'm like what kind of a question is that because we're, we're getting more more people that are um, having questions like or saying things like uh, y- you know we have mobile gamers that are that play Clash of Clans all the time and then we have hardcore gamers that play super competitive games all the time so what what's the difference between those and like Everybody gets all up in arms about everything, and this is where I just get to the point where, like, I say it doesn't matter because uh, some, somehow feminist feminism and um, uh, the portrayal of women in video games got involved, and it all attached onto Gamergate. So at this point, Gamergate it isn't one issue; it's it's uh, it's it's facing the issue of too many things. Mm-hmm. What is a gamer? Uh, how are women presented in games? Are game journalists lying? Are game journalists paying, getting paid money that they don't deserve? Um, it gets it gets so messy and lost that uh, I I stop paying attention. Right. It just yeah. gets so like muddied. Right. That there, you don't you don't even really know what it's about. There anymore. is no single gamer gate. It's just a gamer gate. Now everybody's all you know 
searching everybody else's pockets for what they're doing, and I think it's I think it's unneeded drama that's uh, that's already that's hurting an industry that just started to get its feet. Mm-hmm. Interesting. See, I didn't know think about that. Yeah. This is why I stick around with Mario and Zelda. Yeah. <laughs> Much less drama. Less there's drama. no drama. Actually, it, as somewhat of a side note, I was one of those weirdos that waited outside for the Wii. Um, back in the day, I was waiting outside of Best Buy, and I remember specifically because I think was it uh, Xbox. 360, I think, was coming out at the same time as the Wii. Yes. Yeah. That about right. the, they were coming out the same day. Um, and we were outside of Best Buy, out to the right, there was the Wii people, and outside the left, there were the um, Xbox people. And the Xbox people got into four or five fights. The cops were called um, a, a two or three times, I think. Um, and they were yelling, and people were pushing each other. And no joke, on the right side, where I was sitting with all the Nintendo geeks, um, we all brought our, uh, our our DSs. We're playing playing Mario Kart, and at one point, I said, "I think I'm going to run up to Wegman's. Um, can you save my spot? This is 4:30 in the morning. Can you save my spot? I'm going to go get some sushi." About 15 people hand me 10 bucks and say, "So I'm I get 150 bucks. I'm sitting outside of a thing that for a for a." With the Wii, I could have basically bought one with the money they gave me. So they gave it to me and said, can you buy me some sushi too? So I went to Wegmans, got some sushi, brought it all back, and they were like, oh, I kept your seat warm. Here you go. And it was like this delightful little community. <laughs> and I, it was the weirdest thing. So I love the little Nintendo buddies that I made that day. But so real quick, the as... So, I, I, from what I understand, one of the stores, I don't know which one, opened up their doors really early. Someone got an, an Xbox... Grabbed the Xbox out of the box, drove by Best Buy, put it out the window, and said, Woohoo, you suckers, or whatever he said. They hit a speed bump, and he dropped it, and it shattered on the ground. <laughs> and <laughs> we were just like, um, and then the dude jumped out of the car and was like basically scream crying and <laughs> putting all of the stuff back in his car and he drove away and everyone was laughing at him. But yeah, uh, so you tell that story about your nin- little Nintendo buddies and sorry, that's not a good little Nintendo buddies. Your Nintendo buddies that you made there that <laughs> seemed like, that seems like a a, yeah, that seemed like pretty cool dudes. And then you go into any uh, Xbox uh, like uh, you know a- a- any public game. You, you keep your chat on for 10 seconds, and you will run into a hundred derogatory terms for your mother, your dog, your grandmother, you. It's, it's, a, it's a completely toxic community that's, uh, yeah, as I was saying mm-hmm. before, like, the gamers are not helping the image of gamers at all. Right. Well, I mean, I had a fun little time when I... Yeah, my little... Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, the, there's, there's the little, there's the little <laughs> parts of... Uh, of of gaming community that I, I could tell stories. I know we're running out of time. I could tell stories about like awesome people that I met and like people that I want to meet up with in real life. They were just super cool people. And uh, it's probably that fourteen year old kid that called your mom a hoe, right? It was it was him. <laughs> I want to meet up with him. Yeah, I, want shake, I want to shake his hand. Shake his hand, rip it off, and beat him with it. Greet him with a holy kiss. But yeah, no, I, like I the mean, New Testament. Yeah, <laughs> I meet really cool guys that uh, that you know work day jobs. They have families, and we just get together for a few hours, two times a week. And uh, do some do some fun stuff on on games and um, yeah, but but then there's the, the the disappointing majority that do things like uh, rage at games mm-hmm. <laughs> and call you all sorts of names. Yeah. Well, um, in closing, I just want to ask you what kind of stuff you're currently working on. Um, how would you how would we get in contact with you? Uh, things like that. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, as I said before, I'm, I'm currently just working on, on getting my first real game. Like, I have a working game, but it's just a, it's just a, like a, you know, demo at this point. So I, I have no, I have no actual game, but, uh, I, I will soon. I, I set myself a deadline. Uh, by this year, I'm going to have a, a game. <laughs> and that is so, uh, ambiguous. But I'm going to have a game, no matter how, whatever. I, I just need to finish something and, yeah. So anyway, uh, it's not titled at this point, but to get in, to get a hold of me, I, I tweet about all sorts of uh, just gamer news and, and game development news and indie stuff like that. You can get a hold of me at uh, jazzmasta underscore j at oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, no, master. sorry, that was it. That was like an email. No, <laughs> jazzmaster underscore j. At. That's at. at jazzmaster. I'm saying it, I'm saying it the wrong way. You're yeah. Fucking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So jazzmaster, that's with an A. Yeah. M A S T A, jazzmaster yeah. underscore j. Okay. Correct, cool. right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Well, uh, Jacob, we really appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast. Yeah. Both Thanks episodes. That's yeah, a two-parter whoa, whoa. right there. That's an exclusive interview. So um, it was really cool. I learned a lot. Yeah, me too. Uh, podcast listeners, we hope you enjoyed that. Uh, make sure you follow up uh, with what Jacob's working on. Uh, remember, you can uh, tweet at him at, at uh, jazzmaster underscore J and uh, keep up with what he's doing and look out for uh, the game when he releases that. We'll have all the relevant links in the show notes and stuff like that, too. That's right. That's right. And uh, just to close up today, uh, remember for us at Live Christianly, you can find uh, the show notes at livechristianly.com. Uh, we have links at the top of the page where uh, you can listen to us on uh, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, all that, um, and connect with us in different uh, social networks. Um, remember, if you like our show, share us. We would absolutely be amazingly appreciative and unbelievably grateful to your kindness. And if we see you in real life, I'm sure Dan would give you a hug. Yes. Absolutely. The long, awkward hug. That beard love. That beard <laughs> love. Um, so follow us on Twitter, at LiveChristianly2. Um, tweet at us. Leave a, a message for us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in for Jacob Thompson Part 2. <laughs> Episode 3. Episode 3. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you very much.